This reader interview is sponsored by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. All right, this time we're talking to Sean Michael Robinson, reader with lots of input all the time, and always worth checking out his posts when he does. Well, thanks. How are you doing, Sean? Oh, I'm doing pretty well. I seem to remember the first time I uh, commented on uh, one of the first episodes, it was because I was in the hospital and I had a lot of time on my hands. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so a lot better uh, now than I was then. <laughs> well, yeah, the drugs help in my experience. No, it, it, it's true. And uh, they give you the drugs when you have, um, they take out parts of your body, uh, appendix, otherwise. Well, uh, are you ready to play our game? I am. Fire away. I'd like to hear it. Okay. Yeah. All right. First encounter with a wolf story. Oh, geez. There was a guy I knew um, on my water polo team, and he had a copy of the Orb edition of Shadow and Claw. And uh, it was one of those sort of secret handshake types of things. We passed it back and forth. And, um, you know, I remember him reading it on the bus and, and being really finding the both the design and the Don Mates illustration on the cover being really compelling. And uh, at that point, I was, uh, I think, 15 years old. I had already read through several different science fiction authors that, uh, you know, the middle school librarian was kind enough to point me towards. Uh, I'd read, you know, all of McCaffrey, <laughs> uh, all of Robert Heinlein, and then got into a little bit of uh, Philip Dick and tried out a few other things. And my grandfather um, was a voracious science fiction reader, and he gave me a big box of books uh, that summer. Oh, that sounds awesome. And uh, yeah, it, so, you know, really fantastic box that I kept on going back to. So every time somebody would bring something new up, it was like, you know, oh, and hey, I happen to have something from from uh, my granddad. And uh, that was the case with this, too. So. I was like, oh, I've got that copy of that weird looking book, Earth of the New Sun. Maybe I should check that out sometime. But uh, yeah, um, so uh, water polo teammate, Ivan Von Hack, uh, gave me uh, the first half of the book of the New Sun and um, read it over and over again the next uh, year or two. You just read the first half? I read the first half so many times. Um, before I read, before I read the book three and four, you know, it's like 15 bucks or something, James. I mean, and did you ever, I wonder how that whole thing turned out. (laughs) (laughs) It did, but I found the, the prose dense enough for my feeble young brain that I felt like having as much time as possible with it was beneficial to me. But eventually I went down to the big Barnes and Noble, uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> downtown Orlando and uh, picked up, you know, volume three and four also in the orb edition and uh, finally got the rest of the story. Uh, not that I was necessarily enlightened. Uh, at that no, point. no, no, that will never happen. So. <laughs> That's what I'm beginning to, yeah, beginning to come, <laughs> come to grips with here. I guess. Yeah. When you think about it, if you haven't gotten it by the end of claw, then you know the next two volumes aren't going to help you so no uh, cer- certainly not no. <laughs> he explained it all to you in the play so what is it you want <laughs> right well yeah no that's that's exactly and and uh, maybe we can come back to that at the end there but i i i really there was somewhere there is a world in which gene wolf did not write a coda <laughs> and I wonder how different that world looks in terms of the appreciation of the books. All right. Well, how about let's do the next one. Yeah. Uh, favorite novel or short story, either or both. Uh, I mean, <sighs> I hate to be that guy, uh, but, I, but I'm going to have to tell you, uh, I think probably Book the New Sun is. Uh, You're almost all the guys yeah. <laughs> and all the women, too. So I know. Yeah. You should don't be don't be ashamed at that. Well, I, you know, I don't know if it was the time that I read it or what, but I had never read any Dickens uh, before I was 15. And that same year that I read Book of the New Sun or the first half of the Book of the New Sun for the first time, I also read Great Expectations. Um, I got some experience reading early translation of Les Miserables, um, you know, which was very close in character to that type of writing. And they all seem kind of a, of a piece to me in the sense that like, 
you get short declarative sentences, but you also get a sentence that goes on for a page and a half and takes you across all, all of London <laughs> and uh, brings you from the death of a sparrow to the bombing of a hospital. Right. And that was acceptable. And, you know, I, right. It took me a while to come to the grips with the idea that the style of book of the new sun was not necessarily wolf style. I don't, I don't want to call it a pastiche because I don't think that that's really mm -hmm. accurate, but yeah. Well, it's his style in that. I, I think uh, Joanna Russ identified this quite early where er everything takes place very much in the present. You'll have little moments that don't pay off as significant until much later. You have these right. rather important moments that just seem brushed off and and skipped over i mean it's all of it's all there but you're right it's a different it's a different voice and people keep looking for that same voice in other writings and they, it does and some are disappointed that they don't see it yeah well and 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 uh and and i having my reading experience up to that point had been that i mean by the time i was you know 15 and i had read every single robert heinlein book i could have written you a robert heinlein pastiche <laughs> that had that right. sort of voice, you know, what, what you know, choosing among the three <laughs> time periods of Heinlein, you know, and it was frustrating as a reader who, who was, you know, probably not a very adept reader at that point to try to dig into more of his work and just, I, I was stymied by the, the lack of connection stylistically, let's say, mm -hmm. um, with with uh, book of the new sun now i mean i since have gotten over that and um you know i've read all of the early novels all of the uh, books in the solar cycle and uh, you know i read i mean at least once all of the 80s and 90s novels as well and sort of dipped my feet mm -hmm. into the short stories but the book of the new sun was the one that really captured me and grabbed me although the short sun i think is equally fantastic and really did kind of reassure me on a stylistic point that he could just turn it on at, at will. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. stunning. Absolutely right. stunning short son. You just, it just, he's just like, ah, oh, I could do that. Here it is. <laughs> yeah. Here it is for three pages. And yeah, I had mentioned that how impressed I was that Wolf's last novel, which is, yes, it's somewhat inscrutable. <laughs> somewhat inscrutable it's, it's quite inscrutable but the prose is still there it's probably the best prose he's written in years it's beautiful he never lost it what you you knew i mean you had you had personal connections with him i mean what did he just just wasn't interested in that or was it was it i think he wrote literally wrote the novel the the books that he was interested in yeah. at the time um he could do different things. He could do different things. He did do different things. He had a 50 year right. career. He is kind of hard. People think they can, they can create a pastiche of, of well, if you really can't, no, uh, you can do, you can do a pastiche of the book of the new sun. Right. You can do a pastiche of maybe some of his other things. It, it, you could do a, probably a pastiche of Pandora by Holly Hollander. Yes. But you can't do a, a wolf. He changes. He's, he's very much a chameleon. Well, I, I guess I wondered if if you you think that that was his and it, that's all about intention or whether it was just pleasurable for him to try on different voices. I yeah, I think he was. I, I mean, I don't know. I never asked him that that question, but I, yeah, I think he just likes to try them on. He likes he likes voices. I, as far as I could tell, yeah. he he did. I've never seen him speak so emotionally about any of his novels the way he did about an evil guest, which is huh. not most people's favorite yeah. <laughs> story by him at all. But he loved that main character, uh, Cassie. And he was, he, he spoke about how sad he was that when he reached the final end, when she gets in the spaceship and flies huh. off, that he was never going to be able to write that character again, which <laughs> That fact in itself, I think, is kind of a hint about the book. Why couldn't you write a, a sequel about what she's doing? She's getting a spaceship and she's flying someplace else. But, you know, that's that voice 
he loved. He loved writing about it. He loved the way she would talk and what she would do stuff. I like doing different things. Right. And he just struck me as somebody. He, I mean, he's he put this in. It, you can, I think you can read it in Castle of Days or Castle of the Otter that if someone asked him how to become a writer, he would t- always tell them, "Don't." I heard him say this actually <laughs> ten years ago, and he, he's because if you could convince someone not to be a writer, they were never going to make it. <laughs> You're either, it's something that you do because you have to do, because you have to get these stories on page or, or not. I, I don't mean any of the stylistic talk as a, as a uh, shot against him either, just sort of a, <laughs> explaining the sort of, I, I went from a person who just, oh, I like this guy. I'm going to read or mm-hmm. this, this person. I'm going to read everything they ever met. You know, I read every single book that Madeline Lingle wrote, you know, probably in a f- five month period or something. And you can always hear her voice. Always hear her voice. Exactly right. But then here's somebody who every single story was like, where am I and what am I doing here? (laughs) Which is incredible from one perspective and then from the perspective of the person who just wants more of the junkie. (laughs) You know, you can't get it. It's not there for you, Sean. No, he's done with it. Yeah, he's he's already written that story. He's done. I mean, look how different Earth of the New Sun is from Book of the New Sun. I, I, I could not even believe. I, I cannot tell you how many times I put down that Bulletin. book and just like, I am not going to read about Severian on a spaceship. <laughs> I, that, that Gundam that, you know, is giving him orders. He's not going to get inside it again. He's, he's not going to fly around. I can't do it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> when I read Book of the New Sun, it made, gave me this paranoid feeling the whole time I'm reading yes. it. Very uncomfortable, which oh, yeah. kind of surprises me. <laughs> but, I, but I think there's the, just the thought of somebody only reading half the book. Right. Well, it's not, uh, I, I, I had the need to solve it mm-hmm. before it was over. Yes. Right. Um, I knew that, you know, there's, there's something about, there's something about Dorcas being under the sedge the, the the water with all the tannin and the the mud you, mm-hmm. there's something about that image that to me is resembles the content of the entire book you, you never quite get a grasp of the whole thing and and you know the sense that we're, when Severian's freaking mm-hmm. out in the sand garden and he feels like there's somebody that's nearby and he can't see her you feel like you're in the presence right. of something that's not on the page and you don't have to read the whole book, uh, I think, to to realize yes. that, you know, like I wanted to solve it. I, I wanted to figure out <laughs> what it is that was that That's true. is being, com- right. you know, compelling me to read the asides over and over again. And, you know, I I mean, one thing I knew for sure is that this was not the author talking to me. And that was something. It's a novel. From the future, right. not that's, about the that's, future. That's a that's a, that's a very that's a very true statement. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, I felt, I felt the need to solve it, uh, before, uh, before I had the whole thing. Well, I just expected him to finally explain everything near the end. I kind of treated it like a, like a thriller or a mystery or something like that, where you're going to finally get to the end. And then right. some guy, he's going to have some guy in a, in a room where they, they talk and he explains all these things and how he figured it out. And, <laughs> you know. It, you know, even with the deus ex machina, you know, you think uh, the God literally came out of the sky to help him and tell him <laughs> and that wasn't enough. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. So, so, I mean, that's the thing I, I was, I, I've really wanted to ask you when you, when you said that, you know, we, we get to talk uh, a little bit. I mean, I was just struck by what, I mean, I, I wonder what the world in which there is no earth and a new sun uh, looked like. I realized that the, you know the the critical reputation of of um, Book of the New Sun is pretty high uh, now compared to most books of its relative popularity that are forty years old. Um, but I really wonder what the the reputation of it would have been if there had never been the reveal that this person. Well, that you... I mean, I didn't feel like anything was revealed to me when I read Earth the of the Blood. New Sun. I expected a lot of things to be revealed. I had all these lists of questions I wanted to answer, and I got into Earth of the New Sun, and all I got was a new list of, of, of problems. <laughs> I think I, I think I mentioned this in the summary of Shadow of the Torture, that I think right now I do understand 
why Wolf was resistant to writing a coda at the end. And the reason is, is that, and I think this is revolutionary for a novel, that this is not our Severian's story. He is living in the shadow of the torturer. He's living in the shadow of the person who this is all about. And we're seeing his adventures in the aftermath of everything that happened. And so that's, I wonder what the reputation of the book would be without Earth and the New Sun. Probably not all that different. It was, it was huge at the end, by the time it got to, you know, 1983. But my, my question, I guess, uh, if I could reframe it around uh, people who read it in 1983, who felt like I understand this book, did they know that the person that they read about was going to destru- bring about the destruction of the entire earth and all of its populace no i think that's self-evidently right so not true so so then i I, talk about radical viewpoints yeah i mean (laughs) absolutely (laughs) unprecedented you could write a book uh where the primary conflicts take take place almost entirely off stage and it's not just the the destruction of the earth it's the the warring of these two forces um I mean, the Megatherians are, I mean, we, we call them Megatherians, right? Because that's the book in Alton's library. But I mean, they're barely on the page. I mean, it's stunning to me. Absolutely stunning that you could have, the, I mean, essentially like the elder gods in this story controlling one side and then these other rival gods of a sort on the other side. And 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 it's almost invisible. I mean, it, right? I, it's it's absolutely stunning. Um, I, I'm a I'm a songwriter, and uh, I have been collecting examples of this over a long period of time. That's a kind of pet project of mine. Are songs where the primary conflict of the song is not stated inside of the song, and yet there are enough pieces of debris for you to be able to reconstruct it after the fact. And you know, in a song form. I mean, the investment is, you know, three to five minutes of your time, right? It's not anything at all. But even that, even in the limited place of a song, it's just incredibly rare. I mean, the idea of doing it in a, in a four-volume novel, that he's going to write this thing, and that these conflicts are going to be off the page, I mean, it's just it's just mind-blowing. And I mean, part of me wonders if he wasn't just like, David, you read it and you didn't understand it? You know, like, my <laughs> yeah, I explained it. <laughs> Well, think about the the final scene in Claw the Conciliator that you read over and right. over and over. There's no way at the end of that novel, you might have been able to theorize that maybe that guy was somehow some aspect of Severian, a future, a past version of Severian. You have no idea how, how in what way that could be. Because he, I mean, he literally says, I now know who the the head of the day is right. oh really well <laughs> please do tell <laughs> could, you, could you let me know did you write an index to your book I, I don't think even on the in the discussions before earth of the new sun came out i don't think there was any consensus that severian was a conciliator right yeah 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 there's so but, many things yeah i mean i guess that's the that's the sort of that that's the big question I've been sort of mulling over the, for the past for the past couple of weeks and concerning the book is I, it it just seems like such a, a smuggled conflict I just can't even uh, yeah I mean what if what if you found out that great expectations yeah, I, mean, I don't even know but Miss Havisham has killed uh, <laughs> his parents. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we forgot to tell you that back story. You're right. Yes. Oh, and she's in and she's working for the, the, the queen as a special agent. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and it's actually tied up with the um real life uh Jack the Ripper uh, murders, you know, uh 40 years later. I mean, I I just can't even I, it it's hard to, you know, it sounds ludicrous trying to come up with an equivalent to a novel that you know really well because people have mined them for hundreds of years of uh yeah english classes right but but i mean i i wonder if he hadn't ever written that coda you know what that would look like if if 
the book was still being regarded by people 40 years later? Yeah, that, that's a that's a very good question. He he did at least give us a lot more to fight over. So that was nice. Right. All right, let's go to the next one. Yeah, sorry, I derailed things. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's good. That's the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> Favorite wolf word? You know, um, I want to say omophagist, but I don't actually know that's how to a good pronounce one. it. So that's you can read it on the page. It works. I'm sure it is omophagist. Or that's why I'm going to do it. Omophagist? <laughs> I don't know. That sounds wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's a little. Uh, I don't know. It's a little precious. Amophagist. <laughs> for for what they are right. considering it. <laughs> um I, I i think that all of the word the religious words are fantastic i mean uh you know he does such a good job of avoid despite the saints names uh, uh, uh avoiding um canned words with even canned concepts like you know mm-hmm. pan creator i mean just right. it's fantastic and the first yeah, time you read really. Pan Creator, if you have, you know, any amount of exposure to the English language, you know exactly what it means. But it's new. Um, you know, Argent. Right. I mean, he didn't invent the word Argent, but I certainly think that's probably the first time it was used that way. Uh, that's the color that's whiter than white. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I don't know why. I'm yeah. It's... Telling <laughs> Is that your new <laughs> word? <laughs> you have to go with that one. <laughs> All right. Um, personal non-consensus theory about a wolf story or your favorite one you know i i i feel like i'm waiting for you to crack open the family tree oh yeah yeah i forgot yeah you're into the family tree i i i am i know that mark uh aramini thinks that it's sort of a sideshow compared to the rest of it but why (laughs) would he put that in if it's a sideshow i mean clearly the you know, I mean, you talk about influence of Catholicism, you know, the developing of all these relationships that don't necessarily exist on the page as a, you know, hallmark of, it seems like Catholic, you know, developmental doctrine. Right. I don't know exactly what you would call that. And even if it doesn't have some kind of significance in a got you sense, I mean, I think it's fascinating. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think that your guys uh, theorizing about Catherine, that she is permitted to come back over and over again for each of his elevations and some type of exchange is, is a yeah, is sure. a remarkable tying up of uh, that. I've always been fascinated by the Catherine Catherine connection and it never really quite made sense. But the idea that she's living all mm-hmm. those things in a single day and that that might have some type of connection to Valeria. Um, and that's probably the most compelling sort of new theory that's been, you know, bandied about. Well, I'm I, I'm hesitant to to push you to go further since so many of them are mine. But well, I'm... obviously, I, obviously, it's hard for me to pick my favorite of crazy theory that I have. So they're all my children. Well, I, I, you know the 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 idea that Valeria and Catherine are connected seems true to me, even if I don't know what direction that works. Or why it works. Well, the more you take a look at the at the Gildas stories, St. Gildas, mm. and the uh, St. Catherine stories, the more you just say, oh, I see how he's, I feel like I, I, I know how he's putting all these together. I feel, but I mean, there's a great deal of invention going on in the middle of there. I'm doing a lot of the right. work, but Wolf expected us to. So what am I supposed to do? <laughs> You can't leave it on the table, right? No, I mean, no, you can't. He, I, I had this discussion with with Craig early. Are we not supposed to figure out things like who Severian's mother is? Yeah, sure, we are. <laughs> <We're>, right? <laughs> yeah. Why would he put it in? I mean, exactly. I, yeah. you know, no, apologies to Mark. Uh, <laughs> you know, he can le- leave leave me an irate voicemail. Uh, if you <laughs> I'll give him. My, you can give him my number. Well, he probably will. So, and then <laughs> you should definitely treasure that. <laughs> All right. Uh, most frustrating mystery in a wolf story. Oh, well, I mean, if we just sticking with new sun, I mean, it's just unbelievable. The amount of, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, most frustrating. I mean, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to say never anymore. Um, <laughs> I feel like there are several that will never be resolved in new sun, but you guys have cracked so many in the, in the first pass through the first book i mean it seems like 
I don't want to say never anymore, but <laughs> I, I I have been frustrated by I want I want I want to say the sort of dangling suggested interconnections of some of the coincidental things. Um, Agia staying at the house with Kazdo. Um, just being mm-hmm. at the house with Kazdo. Or Kadro and Kazdo. Ex- exactly that, right. That's a, that's a name connection that that's is just too good. Feels unlikely. Now, yeah. is, for right. Wolf to make. For when, Wolf to once make. you guys convinced me of Kadro that uh, Agilus is identifying himself as Kadro. I mean, it just I unbelievable to me. First off, how many times have I read those three sentences yes. and it never occurred to me that that was him approaching? Of course it is. You're absolutely right. And yet, I mean, I've never seen it mentioned. It doesn't seem like anybody's made those connections before. And a lot of the family stuff before had seemed like, you know, reaching. Um, sometimes people want to make everybody father in Ire, or, you know, it seems like every, every single person in the book is somehow interconnected. And I don't necessarily think that that's true or what's intended. But but once you put in that cadro, I mean, it just that really shook me. So, you know, I would say the most frustrating ones for me are the sort of glimpses of something that seems impenetrable. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, you get, you guys got this, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sure. We're, we're going to crack the whole thing. So <laughs> <laughs> we're going to break this puppy wide open. I mean, obviously, I mean, w- when we first started, all I expected to do was to carefully categorize all the p- gaps that Wolf had left for us. Right. And uh, so I'm, I am very surprised that for myself to have come to the end of Shadow of the Torture, feeling like most of the biggest things I had are explained. Uh, not Agia, not Haythor. Right. Maybe not even Talos, but a lot. A lot. <laughs> so. Yeah, <laughs> the memory, the you know, uh, Thea's doves, all that. Well, although there's more right. about Thea's doves that I don't understand, obviously, but because I don't understand Haythor. But I, yeah, gosh, it's great. <laughs> so maybe, maybe we will. Um, Craig is very hopeful and optimistic that we're going to figure out Haythor by before we're done. Maybe, maybe when we get to the play. I've don't understand it and i'm t- intimidated by the time we get to it we may just i may just have like mark do an uh-huh. episode and maybe lee yeah, or do an episode all people who have strong opinions about that play and uh i i, I think it's there but i think as as michael swanwick said the explanation it's all explained right there if you're smart as you right <laughs> <laughs> which clearly none of us are yeah, is not yeah. not an issue. So, all right. Well, that well, was really good. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, great Sean. Great to talk to you. And um, I, just as a personal aside, I, I found that the prose, oh, it's been tremendously influenced by this book. And it's extremely valuable to me that you guys talk about it and keep it alive in such a valuable way. I, I thought that your, your uh, wrap up of the first book was just absolutely brilliant and really compelling and um especially your discussion about um severian as a moral figure or not and specifically just sort of let me just appreciate your appreciation of that it's a morally sophisticated book and i think that it's easy for someone to enjoy the book on so many different levels that that is something that people don't generally get and that you are seeing the arc of someone who is gone from the lowest possible circumstances from a moral perspective, someone who is brought up to bring pain to other people. And yet there's still a code to that pain. And that code is useful to him, even as he ascends to a place where he can feel empathy for other people and eventually um, feels like he has responsibility for other people. That code that he had at the lowest point is still within him as he moves up that that arc and and it's a fascinating perspective to for somebody to tackle um in a book maybe a not a particularly of this moment perspective where it seems like you know an author would be cautioned against writing something like that 
for fear that they'd be confused with the person that they're writing for, which is just, I mean, absolutely fascinating to me. Yeah. Every time we talk to some like Swanwick or Jack Dan or Clute, I'm always asking, you know, what is it? Mm -hmm. Wolf came up with a lot of really good writers in the, uh, in the new wave tradition. They were all trying to break out of, what people thought science fiction was supposed to be right. Just writing it as literary fiction. They were all doing it. So what is it? What, what is that secret sauce that Wolf had that everyone was noticing it, but no one could quite put the other than to say, it's just very good. And yeah, I don't know. Well, how often do you feel like you're, you are reading the author's perspective when you're reading one of his stories? I mean, no, he's not. You're, I think it's very rare. Yeah, I think it's very. I mean, I I think it probably does happen. I think Ern Smith's view on humanity in a transhumanist age, I think that's probably somewhat shared by Wolf. I don't. I'm not convinced, for instance, that the protagonist in Pirate Freedom is a guy that Wolf likes or agree with. He may be. He may well be a villain. But you know, Severian's morality is a is a different morality. He's he's, he's saying things. I remember I, I, uh, Mark sent me a a letter he got from Wolf where he talks about justice, and he apparently they were talking about Thecla's conversation about you know about religion, about the end create, and how 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 these are gods, are all powerful gods that need to be protected by grandmothers that they would never act to punish somebody before they're condemned but then they will punish them forever after they die when there's no hope of retro of uh, reformation and he says well you know i have to write the best explanation of what these people right. would say and that's that's what thecla would say fantastic <laughs> so, absolutely fantastic <laughs> well he i mean he's giving right. you your intelligence i mean you as the reader are, yeah. are treated as an equal it's it's shocking to me that that wouldn't be something that people would desire, you know. Um, and why why write a novel if if it's all just posturing for position that you expect that your readers will also have? I mean, what what type of engagement do you get if everything that you write is either polemic or candy floss? Right, right, yeah. And and yet, there's several mysteries about Wolf. One is that he wrote the way he wrote when it often feels like no one else in among his cohorts were writing that way. That editors let him write that way. They they accepted his stories when they couldn't necessarily understand what the story was about. Right. And that readers responded to it. But this is all wrong. <laughs> it's not the way you write. So you tell a story. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's kind of a it, it's kind of a, a that's if you're if someone asked me what the greatest puzzle of Wolf is, it's that for me. It's that it all came together and is is somehow appreciable. I don't even know necessarily what it is that attracts me to it specifically, uh, but you know, it somehow it works. It's a little bit of magic. Yeah, and no, it really is. And 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 when he hits all of those layers at the same time, when you have a story that is as compelling on the surface as all of New Sun is, and I mean, it, you know, you have the plowman's meaning, mm -hmm. and it's the plowman's story, but it's also the philosopher's story, and it's also the inquiry. It's you know, all of those layers are functioning equally strongly um well all right well thank you and i got a lot of good stuff now <laughs> you know, oh, yeah i i apologize no no listen it's my job to, to cut it short but i <laughs> i have no discipline and i just keep the, talking people's ear off how many times have you heard well even with my interview with with joan gordon said well you know it's past the time we said and i said oh yeah you know i'm i'm a bit like thecla when you come into her cell i'm just gonna keep talking to you and keep you going well, I, I i can't tell you how much i've enjoyed the podcast i mean you guys are just doing an unbelievable job and um you know my favorite 
my favorite two hours of every uh, two weeks. So thank you for, for doing ah, it, James. That's awesome. Thank and you. Um, and uh, one last thing, 15 seconds, I swear to God. <laughs> when you guys end up talking about the memory transfer uh, stuff, I'm pretty uh-huh. sure that the origin of that, it was intended to be scientific or at least pseudoscientific in background, it was a series of since debunked studies that were done about flatworms in the 70s. Oh, I saw that. Did I see Was that on the rereading podcast list did you put that up oh i don't know i i or maybe it was in, maybe it was in reddit i don't know somebody somebody posted that very recently and oh okay i i i know it because uh it was a basis of a heinlein uh story oh wow uh, heinlein used the concept for something as well and pointed out what it was from in a little essay or something but yeah so that's the that's definitely uh, in my mind the origin of the of the memory transfer idea um, and basically the, the debunking of it was just basically like a researcher was like, no, these guys aren't getting their memories when we ground up the flatworms and feed them. They can smell where the flatworms went last time. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't clean the maze well enough. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, look look into that. I'll never let that get in the, in the way of a good story. Right, exactly. No, it doesn't bother me in the least. I just, it's interesting. That it seems to me that all of the origins of all of those different things are definitely scientific or at least intended to be scientific concepts uh even if terrific so anyway you have a great night james and thank you so much this was again entirely sponsored by the patrons of the rereading wolf podcast you can go to patreon.com slash rereading wolf to play a part in bringing other amazing things like this into the world and if you want to take on the five questions with us, reach out to us by email or one of the other methods listed in the show notes of this episode. We need to bring you closer to me, so don't you squirm. Now.